I thought for this week our Tuesday's tip could be a short video that tells you a little bit more about how to use our Legacy Virtual Users Group community. And as you can see right now, I am on the home page in Google Plus for Legacy Virtual Users Group. And some of you may have just set yours up with all, and if I went there it would show everyone in all of my circles in the general stream. I also have three groups I belong to and one of them is Legacy Virtual Users Group. And as you can see this thin blue line shows you that that's what I've selected to be reading posts, scrolling through information, and it all comes from people who are in the Legacy Virtual Users Group circle that I've made. Now there's a couple other things you can always do. You can see how you're signed in with your avatar. You can uh, go to Hangouts. You can add people. You can check other items. This is your app section in Google+. And this, of course, is me in Google+. But right now we're at the Home section. I'm going to go to Communities and it's going to show you all of the communities that I moderate so I'm part of the admin team and all of the communities that I've joined as well as the number of posts that are available for me to read. I can also scroll through and take a look at other communities that might be out there. I can create a community and I can search for communities. So if you know you're interested in Rhode Island genealogy or Massachusetts or pick any other place, maybe Swedish genealogy, go ahead and search for the community and it'll give you some information to look up. But we're going to go into the Legacy Virtual Users Group community and the big news is that we have 698 members so we're closing in on the 700 mark uh, which is nice and I want to thank everyone who has joined in the recent past as well as all of those of you who've been with us the entire time. Now a couple reminders you're always going to see the newest items in the community in the stream and so you can scroll through some people have their posts set up so that they're only reading uh, one item in in a row I have mine set up to have a, a number of rows in it just because that's the way that I work you'll always be able to find out basic information in the about this community section Always keep this in mind. If you want to go to the YouTube channel to watch uh, previous Hangouts that we've recorded or any tips or any other information, this is the link that will take you directly there. If you want to share the community with someone else they think might be interested in it or another group, or if you'd like to invite people to the community, I think we can all do these types of things. And if you want to post something, this is where you would share it. This is the text. When you open it up, if we were to do that, my avatar shows here because I'm the person who's going to be writing something, as opposed to, for instance, Monique. Uh, but you can type whatever you want, and if you want to attach a photo, a link, a video, or an event, you can do that. And of course, you can select the category. So if you're asking a question, how do I do that? as JL Beacon did, you just can click on that. If you don't know the section that you want it to be in, and there's a number of them, but if you're not sure, just go ahead and leave it in discussion because one of the moderators could rearrange it if it needs to be in a different place, but that's no worries. Just get your comment in there. And I want to remind you that there are, there are no questions that you ask that are too basic or too involved or too anything. If you have a question about legacy and one of the other 697 members here can help you, we're happy to do it. And please keep in mind that if you have a question about something in legacy, the chances are pretty good that at least one other member in our group has that same question. They just haven't asked it yet. So go ahead and provide uh, any tips that you have, any suggestions, um, and any questions questions you have and hopefully user to user will all be able to figure out the answers to this and help each other. So in this regard after you've typed whatever you want in um, you can share it and if you've decided uh, not to share it you can just cancel it and it should do that. 
and it just leaves you with an open section to use. One other thing I wanted to point out, and it's good that this is Monique's question right at the beginning, she had said that she thought there was a post about something lately and she can't find it. And it's probably Legacy Searching 101, and that means that she's probably trying to find it in the Legacy Program, and we need to keep in mind that help section, that question mark that's pretty much everywhere. But she wants to know about tagging those who do not have a find a grave citation in her file and then here you see it says read more because she has more of a question. The one thing that I'd point out and this is just a suggestion and something I try to do is if I'm reading something and there's a portion of it here. Um, I try to break it up a little bit with paragraphs only because I find it easier to read that way. If you go back through and you look at it and you think, oh, I'd edit that a little bit, keep in mind that you can, I can do a couple more things than you all can do, but if Monique were writing this, she could go ahead and um, edit that post. So it gives you the opportunity to go back if you find a word missing or if something wasn't clear you can play with your post a little bit. Oftentimes when I post something I'll go back and put some paragraph breaks in it so that you don't have a long paragraph from me. But anyway, I took a look at what Monique said, and she's very interested in trying to find out the people that she doesn't have anything, any entry in for find a grave. And she, you know, some people took a look at this, and someone provided her with a comment, Ron Walter, which I think is great because he told her another way to approach it. She wanted to know a particular way, and he said, have you ever thought about going in through the back door? And that's a great way to approach problems. We have to think about going around that wall or going under the wall or going over the wall as opposed to trying to just break at the wall ourselves because it's, it's probably going to be easier to try and figure out some other um, angles to do our research from. But anyway, he gave her one and she responded back. And that's great. That's what we want, that interaction of the, me of the members of the Legacy Virtual Users Group. The one thing I would like to encourage people who've just joined the group or maybe just joined Google Plus is to go back at some point and put your avatar in. Uh, we see that Ron is a retired geezer and I am assuming that 94109 is the zip code but it could be something else. In any event you can add an avatar. Um, some people use their picture and that's an easy thing to do. Uh, JL Beacon uses uh, the initials. Uh, you could put on an avatar that's really anything that you want it to be. Uh, and that is something that you do in the profile section for Google+. But one other thing I wanted to point out here is this tells you, I always keep the notifications off because I don't want to get notified every time somebody posts in this community because I go to the community twice a day and check it and that's sufficient for me. Uh, one of the other moderators in the group has notifications on so she knows when things get posted and she's the one who does a little bit of the cleanup. If you don't want to get notified every time there's a post in the um, Legacy Virtual Users Group, you would do what I do, which is just turn off notifications and then clicking on it again turns on your notifications. And this is one of those things you're going to want to check in this community as well as a number of other communities because some people have complained that they're getting emails all the time in their Gmail from the various communities they belong to. If you're one of the people who goes into your communities and checks them and that's the kind of person I am, I don't have notifications on because I don't want my email collecting all of those notifications. I just come to the community, read through the new posts, comment if I want, and move on. Something to take a look at, and all of these things are things you can do in your Google settings, and that's up to you to set it how you want in Google settings. And you have a number of settings here. Anytime you see a gearbox, that is settings, as well as these are settings in Google Chrome, if that's the internet browser that you're using. Now the one thing I wanted to point out here is, Monique had a question about find a grave, and one thing I would do is go into the search feature here and what you'll find is I typed in find a grave and it gave me all of the posts in, in the legacy virtual users group community that have find a grave 
in the post. And so Google does that quick search for me. You'll see this is tips and tricks, so it's not looking in our category. It's actually looking to see if I ever said find a grave or typed it here, as well as if anyone else did. And so you're going to find by scrolling through here all of the entries in the Legacy Virtual Users group that had to do with find a grave. And this is a great feature to use because you might be having a question about a census entry or perhaps you want to know about sources and particular sources. Uh, perhaps you're interested in ancestry or how to use legacy with family search. Any of those types of things, just go ahead and put your search right here in the Google search bar and it searches the community. And you can, every single community has this search feature. So go ahead and search for whatever you're looking for here. And that might be your first approach before you go in and ask a question. If you think you've seen it in the community and you're trying to find it, it's much easier than trying to look for the date or trying to look for maybe who said it. So there's a number of ways of finding things. And as you can see here, um, I posted about JL Beacon's experience with using Find a Grave, which in many instances has been really helpful as this person has gone through and done that research on a massive scale. Also, if we had a Tuesday's tip that included anything about Find a Grave, it's here. And by just clicking on this arrow, you can watch the video right here in the community. But just be aware that those videos are also on the YouTube channel. And if anyone had any pictures or any examples or another link, and this is doing some sources in Roots Magic with Find a Grave, you can really look anywhere and you're going to find whether there's photos, links, videos, they're all going to be here. And so that's what I would encourage you to do if you're looking at something like that. Now the other thing that I'm going to show you is how I went in and played in Legacy to find some Find a Grave citations. And so that is going to be the next section of this video. I'm going in and just opening up uh, Legacy and I'm going into the search feature and I'm going to look at find and then in this instance you would click on individual you would also click on event name and it says equal to and right here you can select an event so if you've done your events or facts and I view those as interchangeable I use my event and facts section to keep track of every piece of information it does not have to be an event it could be a fact it could be a note that I'm making to myself but it keeps everything in chronological order for me this is a tip that I got from Linda McCauley and I really like it because you can make a decision what things you want to print on a chronology but it keeps it all in there in chronological order in any event, if you select an event, it gives you a drop-down list of everything that you might have for an event. For instance, I have the U.S. Headstone application, U.S. Veterans Gravesite, voter registration. What we're looking at right now is Find a Grave. So if I type in Find a Grave, that is my first search feature. And clear the list before you do a search and you can either go through them or you could create a list and then if you did this you would have a list of in this instance the 257 individuals all in alphabetical order who have a find a grave entry now this list is here let's make it a little bit bigger so that we can see what we're doing uh, for instance, if we were to go to this person, you could look at their detail. If you wanted to edit anything, you could do that. And this is how some people work with their individuals. It tends not to be how I do it. But I do go into the events, and you can see that I've added a number of censuses. But in this instance, just by hovering over the description area, you see that it, that it shows me what my entry looks like. But I can also come down here and edit. 
and what that's going to do is show you how I enter the event for a person that's find a grave. I make that my fact or event. The description is the memorial number. The date is the date that I see that the memorial was entered on find a grave. All right, and then the place is the location of the find a grave memorial that was entered. So that's going to be where the cemetery is or the mausoleum or whatever it is they're working with. Um, there's a couple of things I do and I'll just show you here it's in the notes section I always leave this first line blank but I enter the information just on a copy and paste of literally what is in the find a grave memorial that's been added by whomever added it and in this case it was Larry Boyd he added it on September 13th 2011 that's the date I have here you can see that the burial is in Buffalo Dallas County Missouri I've done that same thing there um, entered it in the place um, and I've just entered the information as they provided it because I'm not judging the veracity of this information for purposes of this event I'm simply saying this is the event or the fact someone entered this in find a grave if they have a picture of the tombstone or whatever that can be included as well but this is the information that was there on the date that they entered that so we can save that event and then one other thing I want to look at is the source and it says here it has a source citation so we're going to go to the source citation and it says it's find a grave. I list it and this is just my source listing name. It's a cemetery USA find a grave. And I also list in the detail here and you can see it. It's an entry for Susan Summers, the memorial number and the date. If I were to take a look at the source, this tells me my master source definition. I've given it the title, which is, this is my source list title, Cemetery USA Find a Grave. This is the person who put together this database, and it's cemetery records, compiled records with a database online. And this is how I view Find a Grave. The person's name is Jim Tipton. He's the owner of it. Now I know that it's been incorporated somehow into Ancestry, but it's still maintained by uh, Jim Tipton, Tipton as the developer. It's a database and images. The website title is Find a Grave. I've listed the URL. It was started in 2002 to current. And I could say a recording date on this, you know, whatever, that's fine. I don't put any of this other information in. You need to take a look at it yourself. Uh, but the one thing that I compared this to was something that I use a lot, which is Evidence Explained. I do make use of text and comments, but I make use of them in a different way than some other people might. I explain what this master source is. Uh, and it's telling you that contributors submit listings, how many contributors there are, and how long it's been in existence. This is information that I gained from the website. My comments about the master source are how I do my data entry. So if someone else were to have a copy of this file, they would know how I did the data entry for Find a Grave. How am I sourcing this? Why do things show up where they do? And how I would want them to follow along and do it as well. So I say my Find a Grave entries are listed in the following manner. The description section, the date section, the notes section. I always use the name as it appears on the memorial because oftentimes, certainly in the case of many women, they're married. The name that shows up on the tombstone is their married or maybe their second marriage surname, not their maiden name, which is how they're maintained in legacy. So you want to know what that connection is easily. Um, I change some of the uh, spacing once I've copied and pasted it and I explain how I do that and then I mark the entries with a tag to go back and check that I've ent entered all the source entries because I tend to work in batches and I use the detail information is entry for name comma memorial number and that's sufficient to comply with the citation format found in Evidence Explained as my contributor information is in the notes section of the entry. And then I list the repository. So that's my master source definition. When I go into detail for this one, 
I've followed my own instructions, which is entry for Susan A. Summers, comma, memorial number, and the date that it was accessed. Now, I haven't used the surety levels. Um, I was going to wait until Legacy 8 came out and then switch them all up and look at them, and I noticed that it's still something that doesn't print out yet, so I just haven't used it very much um, because although you can analyze your source quality here, it doesn't come out in a report, and that's something that I really want to see. I list the date that I recorded it, and in this instance, it was the day that I accessed it. It was the same day that I recorded it. And you can see what your output preview looks like in the footnote or endnote citation, a subsequent citation, and the bibliography. And the important thing to keep in mind here is we want to know who the person is and the memorial number because when you go back to fit, um, when you go back to find a grave, you can enter the person's name or the memorial number and find that entry again if you need to. So those are two really important pieces of information that you want to make sure is in a footnote or an endnote to take a look at. Next week, we're going to show you how to make a list of those find a grave entries without citations, as well as those in your family file without a find a grave entry that you might want to search for. How to make, save, and print a bite sized search. So, we'll see you next Tuesday for another Tuesday's tip and on September 17th for our monthly hangout. Thanks.